Mm -hmm. Going? Mm -hmm. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. We are going to continue where we left off last week, so please grab a Bible and open to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. We are rounding the corner, gang. Um, almost, almost to the end of this letter that's been just great. It's been wonderful. It's been timely. The majority of this letter, of course, was written um, so that we would see the difference between what real Christianity is, to differentiate that between uh, real and fake Christianity. John's been giving us a lot to think about. But here we are rounding at the end. We're rounding third, headed home. And these last nine verses, starting in verse 13, which we looked at last week, uh, John is doing something extraordinary for us. He's doing something great for us. And that is um, that we're, we're, it's clear. John, God, wants us to see that it's okay for us to be confident about certain things. In fact, the title of this message is part two of Christian Confidence. So as we... As we're looking at this passage in front of us, again, nine verses, 13 through 21, he's given us a list. And he says, in verse 13, he says, okay, these things I've written, four and a half chapters, I've written these things, and here's why. So that you who do believe, because I've, I've differentiated between what false faith, faith and real faith looks like. For those of you with real faith, I want you to know that you have eternal life. And then he goes on for the following verses, and he says this word, no, o kios, he says it a total of seven times in nine verses. The word no is, um, you know it so well, you're so familiar with it, it's like you're, it's the same familiarity you have with your own family, that you know it that intimately. You know your family's good, bad, and ugly, it's, if your family's familiar with you, to you, you're intimate with them, that's the same kind of knowledge he wants us to have with each of these things he's listing in these verses. Starting with, I want you to know, like secondhand nature, that, that you who are saved have God's life in you. Now, again, like I told you last time, this is not something that's very comfortable in the world. It's, it's not a comfortable thing. It's not taught. It's not something that's, that's uh, put in front of us to be confident, at least not in the right things. We live in a very uncomfortable place, a very uh, unco uh, unconfident place, a very uncertain place. People are uncertain about everything. We, can't, we don't even know what's right and wrong according to the world. What used to be right is now wrong. What used to be wrong is now right. We don't have confidence about you know, who created the universe. We don't have confidence about the future, any of our futures. We don't have confidence about our health, our livelihoods, our families, our relationships. And then along come the Christians. And we say, well, we have confidence. Not in ourselves. It's not arrogance he's calling us to. It's not self-righteousness he's calling us to. We're confident because we trust in God and we trust in what he says. We're confident in our Lord, so therefore we're confident in his word. So, number one on the list, last week we saw that he, God's children need to be absolutely confident that they have eternal life. Here's the second one. Today we're going to find out this. In verses 14 through 15, and by the way, the next chunk of the passage really is from verses 14 through 17. We're only going to cover half of that. We're going to cover verses 14 and 15 today, and we'll get to the rest of it at a different time. Um, but here's the next thing on the list. God's children are to be absolutely confident that God hears their prayers and that God answers their prayers. It's twofold. He hears and he answers. And not just with an answer, not with choice C on four different choices, no. He answers with the only answer because it comes out of his will. When we pray according to his will, he hears every word and he answers according to his will. We're going to see that today. Look at the verses. Verse 14 says, This is the confidence. Peresia. This is the assurance. This is the frank and bold conviction which we have before God. That, if we ask anything, underline that word, anything, according to God's will, He hears us. And then to follow up verse 15, he says, And, if we know that God hears us in whatever we ask, we know, also know, that we have the requests which we have asked from Him. Before we go any further, Let's bow and let's ask God to be our teacher. 
bow with me in prayer. Uh, Lord, uh, what a privilege. These kind of passages, they just, Lord, they're so fun. They're so fun to preach. And it's, it's, so, um, uh, it's so impactful. It's so practical. Every time we can open your word and you talk to us about prayer, Lord, what a practical thing. Because this is something we live in, Lord. We live in a constant state of prayer. And so, Lord, this morning, this is your time. This is your pulpit, Holy Spirit. Lord, I'm unworthy. I am, I am not worthy to change or, or have the power to change anybody's mind or alter anybody's life. Um, so, Lord, we, we say move the man behind and, and take over, God, because you have the power not only to change our minds, but to convict us and encourage us. Lord, you're our discipler. We're your disciples. We're your followers. You have the power to invest these words and these principles right into our very lives, right into the heart of the matter. So we're not just hearing them, but we're doing them, but we're living them out obediently. So God, we ask you again to take these verses and these principles and make them come alive in the, in the circumstances of our life. That we examine our hearts, Lord, to see where we're off and you put us back on track. We ask you to do these things in the name of Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, well, how I want to handle this is, I'd like to start off, because you notice that in verse 14 he says that we ask anything, there's a little phrase, according to his will. And if we're asking that in that manner, well, whatever we ask, he's going to answer that request. I think there's a theological side of this that we have to cover, so we're going to start with that. And then we're going to go practical a little bit. Let, let me say this, though. Let me start off, I guess, with a little practical. Um, as I disciple you guys and, and uh, pastor you guys, and as I'm listening and, you know, among other Christians and other pastors, and uh, just in my own experience as a believer, a flawed person myself, I, I found something that's really interesting when it comes to prayer and, and how we look at that as believers. Usually, um, people fall into one of two categories when it comes to, to wrong thinking about prayer. Some people say, well, you can't ask God for anything. You can't do that. And almost like there's a fear of asking God for stuff. Okay, well, that's not right. That's not biblical. You remember in Philippians when he's talking about the anxiety, you know, when you're filled with anxiety? He said, well, what do you do? Do you say, just try to figure out on your own and just sort of hand God this thing generally? He says, no. You go to Him in prayer and you hand every ounce of your heart, all your questions, all your doubts, all your fears, all your cares, all your supplications, you hand it all to Him. And you do it with thanksgiving and He'll cover your heart and mind with His peace. It's okay to ask. In fact, in James He said, well, you don't have because you don't ask. On the other hand, some people, um, and this is really... I find this a lot. Some people, they're afraid to pray because they feel unworthy to pray or unworthy to have, make requests of God. You know, I, I've blown it so often, so many times. My goodness, I, how in the world can God not be just rolling his eyes at me? And there I go again. And Satan, of course, helps us think those, along those lines all the time. So I want you to hear these words. Just take this in, guys. You hear what God's saying here? First of all, He wants you to be confident. He wants there to be no doubt, no wavering. When you pray, God hears you. And it's not like, you know, there's a difference between hearing and listening. I've learned that from marriage. You know? It's one of the things that marriage teaches a man. You know how you're watching a football game and your wife is talking to you? You... Really, she said that? Uh, that's, that's terrible. Yes, it does do. Uh, oh, yeah, did you wear shoes like that? That's great. You're listening, but you're not hearing. Right? That's not how God hears us. God doesn't, you know, go, oh, you're, you're praying again? Okay, yeah, go ahead and talk to me, but i got to handle Saturn. <laughs> you know? Well, oh, look, a comet. I mean, yeah, what did you say? No. <laughs> Beloved, God hangs on every syllable we pray. That's how you listen to your wife, by the way. You shut off the TV, you look her in the eyes, and you listen to her heart. That's how God listens to us. He hears every single word. Okay? Um, 
And also, you know, so going back to verse 13 for a second, he says, you need to have confidence. You need to know that you have eternal life. If you're in Christ, you need to know that. That's not something God wants you to, he doesn't want you walking around with the eternal life he gave you, like you have some kind of, you know, treasure in your pocket. Oh, but I can lose it, or it could be stolen. No, eternal life can't be stolen from you, and it can't be lost. He embeds it deep within your soul. But here's the thing. Eternal life has started because eternal life is more than just a quantity of life. It's not just living forever. Eternal life is a quality of life. It's possessing the very life of God. So eternal life, if you're in Christ, has already started. But here's the thing. We can't enjoy the absolute fullness of what that brings because we're still walking around in this sinful world and we're still walking around in this sinful flesh suit, right? So the fact of the matter is, guys, in the meantime, while we're waiting for glory, while we're waiting for heaven, we've got problems and we've got struggles and we've got concerns and we've got issues to deal with. So translation, we've got a lot to talk about with the Lord every single day. And that's what John is saying. He's saying, yep, that's the way it is in this world. But, believer, you could be encouraged because you could be confident and assured. You can have a bold conviction that whenever you communicate with Jesus from the depths of your humble, obedient, surrendered, surrendered heart to Him, every word, every syllable that you breathe to God, He hears you. And whatever it is that you're asking for in His will... Not only does he hear it, you've got to be convicted of this too. Completely confident of this. If he hears you, he's going to answer you. Oh, and by the way, how often does he hear you? Every time. So how often is he going to answer you? Like 50% of the time? 75% of the time? No. 100% of the time, he will answer so what that brings to us, guys, is that this knowledge that God is going to walk with us through whatever we're going to face. And the full resources of the power of God are ours in prayer. By the way, he says in Hebrews 4.16, you can come confidently. You can come courageously to the throne of grace whenever you have need. And I don't know about you, but I am in need pretty much, oh, I don't know, 100% of the time. So that means that no matter how often you come, there's never going to be a moment when God says, you again? Really? I thought we already answered this. You know, the last time you had this trial, remember how I taught you, you know, you're going you're gonna to have to go through this again? Oh, brother, never, never will you hear those words from God. Never will you sense those words from the Holy Spirit. By the way, theologically speaking, the hearing here, um, it's not just that he's not passively like hearing you a little bit at a time. This is a positive hearing. This is a hearing that's going to dispatch the right answer every time. So you're never going to come to the Lord and go, Lord, struggle, <laughs> fear, casting. And he goes, ooh, dang, I didn't see that coming. Yikes. Well, I guess I could answer this in three different ways. I got this choice and that choice and that choice. I guess I'll choose choice three and see what happens. Never. God will dispatch not just an answer, but the right answer every time. And this little phrase that we ask anything according to His will, He says before that, we have confidence before Him. That little phrase, guys, having confidence before Him, basically means in His presence. So it's a common thing, particularly for the young people, to say, I want more presence. I want more of the presence of God. I want more of the presence of God. Basically, we have the confidence which we have before Him that we pray. If you want more of the presence of God, you need to pray more. And there's your answer. And I will say, it's hard to get more present than, you know, living inside of you 24-7. What an incredible confidence it should give us to know that while we're waiting for the full redemption of our, our bodies, 
we're waiting for you know pass into the, to the next phase of life in heaven until then the God of this universe hears our prayers and the God of this universe cares about everything we're saying and he always has the right answer now one other thing theologically speaking I gotta, I gotta say and no sermon about prayer in his will would be complete without me saying um, if we say anything according to his will, that's a very key phrase, okay? He says it a lot. He uses different terminology, like uh, John 14, 13. He says, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. He says in John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done. So, the key to this is you're asking anything. You get to ask God anything according to His, what? His will. Now, that doesn't mean that you pray, you know, praying for a Ferrari, praying for whatever, and I said, in Jesus' name, there in the end, there you go. That qualifies it. See, God, I said in Jesus' name. So everything I said, now you are obligated to answer that prayer the way I want you to. In Jesus' name is not this magic formula, motto, saying, you just tack it on the end of a prayer. That's, that's not at all what it means. Um, God's not a genie, guys. We, we don't rub a lamp and just ask for whatever we want. This is not praying according to our will. And unfortunately, I think a lot of Christians or professing Christians, they go and ask God and they say, according to your will be done. But really what they're doing is they're asking with the motive of their own will and they're trying to make their will God's will somehow. So let's do this. Let's switch to the, the very practical. And I, I, I want us, I really, I asked the Lord, I said, God, you know, we have sermons about prayer and it's always according to your will and in your name. And, and we kind of understand that a little bit. But really, what does that mean? What does it mean to say, I'm praying according to your will, God? What does that mean? And I, I want us to do this. If you have a Bible, turn back to the Gospel of John in chapter 6. And if you have it on your phone, just put it in John chapter 6. Here's what I want to do. I want us to go to, it's the same author, right? John, the Apostle John. I want us to, to, to go to this event where Jesus feeds the thousands, the multitudes. And this is sort of a living, breathing act, uh, uh, event that sort of acts as an illustration for praying in God's name and praying in God's will. It's people communicating with God, communicating with Jesus, and watching Jesus work. And out of this, I think we can find some very practical things about what it means to pray in God's will. And let me say this, before we begin there, I will say this. When you're saying, I want to pray in God's will, think of this one word, motive. M-O-T-I-V-E, motive. So, ask yourself this question. Maybe you're going through something right now, or maybe somebody else you're, you know, praying about and praying for is going through something. When you go to the Lord and, and on your knees, what is the motive of your heart when you're praying? <clears throat> and you can answer that by saying, what is my view of God when I pray about this? What am, what am I seeing? God? How, am I, how, am I, how am I viewing God about this situation? And this what's my perspective of the situation? Um, something very interesting that James said in chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Listen to this. He said, okay, some of you, <clears throat> You don't have because you don't ask. So that takes care of the, can I ask God for things? You know, for kind of present requests to Him? Well, yeah. And maybe you're not seeing that unfold in your life because you're not trusting that God hears you and wants to answer prayers in your life. So you, you don't have because you don't ask. He says, but others of you, oh, you're asking, but you don't receive. And here's why. Because you're asking with the wrong motives. So let's look at this in John chapter 6. And let me paint it for you. The first couple of verses here. Um, Jesus and his disciples have been out all day. It's a long day. It's been a long day of ministry. Uh, it's the end of the day, so it's dinner time. They go back. They're, they're at the Sea of Galilee. And they, they park themselves on the side of a mountain. 
And there's been people that have been following them all day. But this is the Passover time, so this area is full of Jewish pilgrims that have come to worship for this, this special Jewish holiday. So you got literally thousands of people. And they've all heard of Jesus. The buzz is out. Okay, Jesus is big deal. He's, man, did you hear it? He, he, he healed this guy who, you know, who was paralyzed and he made him walk. What, really? Yeah. And, he, and my friend, she, she said that this, a, a friend of a friend of a friend got released from her sin. It's awesome. So the buzz is out. And thousands of people are there. And it's the end of the day. And so these people are coming to where Jesus is. They're, they're floating by. You can just imagine. Thousands of people. It says 5,000 people. But Luke's Gospel tells us, well, that's 5,000 men. But you've got to also account for the wives and the children. So somewhere in the neighborhood of, oh, 7 to 8,000 people are gathering and coming to see Jesus. <clears throat> And Jesus, by the way, is kind of by default here, he's the host of the party, right? There's an impromptu party that just happened, and he's the host, so what does a good host do? When people are hungry, they provide a meal, right? Okay, so now look with me in verse 6. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 5. So we're in John chapter 6, here's verse 5. It says, Therefore, Jesus lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said this to Philip. Now, Philip's one of the disciples. He said this. He says, Hey, Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? Philip, you see all these thousands of people that have gathered? Where are we going to buy enough bread to feed them? And then it says this, verse 6. This he was saying, he was asking Philip this question, to test Philip. For he, Jesus himself, knew what he was intending to do. Okay? So Jesus wasn't asking the question, oh, Philip, I'm, I'm in a bind here, dude. How are we going to feed all these people? No. He was asking this question so he can, the, the heart of Philip could be revealed, and the heart of the other disciples would be revealed. Um, from a human perspective, just, just again, paint it in your mind, this really is an impossible, from a human perspective, an impossible situation. See, Jesus and the disciples weren't walking around with enough food to just impromptu feed 7,000 people. Okay? And plus, their money purse, I promise you, did not have enough money to feed thousands of people. Okay? So, from, a, from a, just a human, worldly perspective here, this really did seem like it was impossible. And I want us to pause here, and I want us to enter into this with your own life and our own circumstances of life. Aren't there so many times that we've experienced where it just seems like this is impossible? This situation is insurmountable, man. From a human perspective, I'm looking here, and I, I just don't know how this is going to end up. There's no way. I mean, I'm sorry, there's no way. Um, we have those moments, and they, they, they seem to come often lately. I love how Jesus basically out loud is pointing out the obvious. Hey, Philip, there's a lot of people here, huh, dude? Yeah. And, oh, and they're all hungry. We all knew that. So how do you think we're going to go about feeding all of them? You think we got enough cash to do that? Um... You think we're going to solve this with worldly means? Do you ever ask that question when you're praying to the Lord about a situation? Do you ever think about it that way? Do um, you ever ask the question, you know, when you pray, Lord, what am I going to do? That's the wrong question. By the way, what are we asking God that question for? What am I going to do? That's the wrong question. Shouldn't it be something like, Lord, what are you going to do? But we tend to take our worldliness to prayer a lot of times. Um, he's still doing this, guys. He's still bringing the impossible, quote-unquote, in front of us. God has a way of pointing out the improbable and the impossible. And He does that so we can, we can our heart will be revealed. He's testing us. See, guys, um, God wants us to see. See, God knows where we're at. But God wants us to see, when the chips are down, who we really trust. It's one thing to say, hallelujah, praise God, I trust Jesus, I trust Him on a Sunday morning. It's another thing to say it when it hits the fan and you have no clue how it's going to be fixed and, and you're just you're panicking and that's when you know this is who I trust, for reals. This is who I trust. 
Am I trusting the world? Am I trusting myself? Good luck with that. Or do I really trust God? James again says something like this. He's talking about, hey, consider it all joy, just full joy when all of the different trials of life come. Because in the end, you know that your faith, your, your faith is going to be tested and that's going to produce perseverance. In other words, God is using all of those trials to reveal something to you and to strengthen you in the end and to build your faith. So, he's testing Philip and he asks him, hey, Philip, where are we going to get enough money to buy thousands of people dinner. And then uh, Philip says, look at verse 7, Philip answered him and said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not even sufficient for them, for everyone to receive even a little. A denarii was basically one day's wage. So he's saying 200 days wages, uh, eight months worth of salary wouldn't even cover what it took to, to feed 8,000 people. Translation, Jesus, there's no way. We got no shot of feeding these people. Are you kidding me? What kind of question is that? Don't we say the same thing to God? God, really, what, what are you doing here? You, you're you're going to allow this to happen? You know, there's a part of me that, you know, I might, might want to put my hand on my forehead and slap it, you know, and say, really, Philip? Now, I know this is early on in Jesus' ministry, but think about what you've already seen, buddy. First of all, you've heard the wisdom of heaven. You've heard teaching you have never heard before. God is speaking words of wisdom, again, like you've never seen, never, never heard. But not only that, you've watched this man heal people with a breath. You've watched him take legs that never worked since birth, and all of a sudden, in an instant, the legs work. You've you watch Jesus forgive sin. Pause. Sorry, guys. Just a minute. It's just closed. All right. Restart. Mm -hmm. um, this, is a, this is a conversation that Philip is having with the Lord that reveals what's inside Philip's heart. And I think this is where we need to start. When we're talking about praying in God's will, here's the first place where you've got to start. Do you believe when you go to God in prayer, especially at those moments when things are pretty scary, do you believe that you're praying to the God who has the power, ability, and know-how to help you in this situation? Do you believe in that God? Because again, when we approach God with circumstances of life, think about it. How many times do we say, oh yeah, yeah, God, God is big and powerful, but can you really help me in this situation? And we're starting to doubt whether or not He has the power, the ability, and the know-how to make everything go out and wash out according to His plan. Do we believe that? In other words, praying in God's will, it's kind of important that we pray, we know who we're praying to, and we're praying to the God of the universe. That's a start. Or are we praying like Philip, who says, well, God, here's my situation. Pretty impossible, huh? I mean, not even you are going to figure this one out. If we're going to pray according to God's will, guys, we've got to believe that we're praying to God and not our version of God. And then along comes a different disciple. This is Andrew. And it seems like Andrew is getting it. So Andrew, it says, look at, uh, at uh, let's see, verse uh, 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, who is Simon Peter's brother, says to Jesus, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish. Now let's stop right there. So what's Andrew been doing? He sees the people gathered, and he starts scouting. Nobody needs to tell him, oh yeah, we've got to feed these people, so let's, so let's go scout and see what I can find. I mean, I guess he's thinking he's going to find enough for these thousands of people. I don't know. But it's kind of funny. He finds this boy, and he says, Okay, Jesus, look, I found this little kid, and he's got five loaves of bread and two fish. Now, you, you want to think, rock on, Andrew. F 
five loaves of bread and two fish. You know that's not going to feed everybody. So maybe he's going to say, hey, Lord, I found this kid who has five loaves of bread and two fish. I can't wait to see how you multiply it. I can't wait to see how you're going to fix this one. This is going to be awesome. But he doesn't do that. He says, there's this lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish. Uh, but what are these for so many people? You know, five, five loaves of bread and two fish, that's not going to cut it. Not, gonna, not even you can do anything with that. And again, I say, really, Andrew? <laughs> I mean, you guys have seen uh, miracles that you never even dreamed of. You've seen this man, Jesus, do it. And you don't have a clue. You, there's nothing inside you that says, oh yeah, he doesn't need but one loaf of bread and half a fish. He's got five whole loaves and two whole fish. We do this all the time. We do this all the time. You know, Lord, I know, I, I look at my, uh, my past, you know, your resume from my past, and I know you, this one you went through, you came through, and this one, and this one, and man, you really came through on this one, but this time, I just don't think you could do it. I just don't, I just don't have the faith that you're going to be able to handle this one. Guys, I, I think we need to start having this idea in mind when we approach the throne of grace. God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I know you're going to do it. I trust that you're going to work the situation and you're going to bring it to the perfect place it needs to be. Oh, and by the way, God, help me because I'm scared. Help me to have the faith I need because I'm really scared here. But I know that I know that I know that you're going to fix this, that you're going to bring it to the place it needs to be. That's a heart that's lining up under the will of God. When the faith in our hearts knows who we're praying to and that nothing is impossible when God Almighty invades our circumstances with His best and His power. That's praying in God's will. There, there's nothing specific necessarily that you, it's required. It's just saying, I don't have the answers, but God, you do, and you have the full resources of heaven, and you're going to invade my circumstances with it. And that's what I'm activating when I pray to you right now. Um, praying in God's will means not praying according to your will. But it's laying down your will and asking God to invade our circumstances with His power. Now let me hand one other thing. For the sake of time, let me give you one other. Um, by the way, the end of the story is, so he took those five loaves of bread and two fish, and he broke them, and he handed it on to the disciples, he says, okay guys, keep breaking, and keep breaking, and keep breaking, and there was Every time, breaking, 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 and it filled the thousands of people, all got full. And in fact, there was, not only was everybody filled and satisfied with the bread and the fish that Jesus miraculously multiplied, but there, there was enough left over for 12 baskets to be filled up. So he had leftovers. Yes, the Lord can abundantly provide, okay? But I, I want to point out somebody in the story that I don't think we, we pay attention to very often in this, and that's the boy who had the fish and the bread. So when Andrew takes this kid up to Jesus, and he says, hey, I found a kid who has five loaves of bread and two fish. I guarantee you Jesus didn't go, oh yeah, give me that. <coughs> Just took it from him, right? Give me that fish, give me that bread. Jesus didn't do that, <laughs> okay? And it doesn't tell us exactly what was said between the two, but it was, you know it was something like this. Great. Hey son, can I borrow that bread and fish? You mind if I borrow that? And the key word there is borrow, because he's about to multiply it. He'll, he'll give it back 20-fold, right? You mind if I borrow that? And now, now, what did the boy do? No. No, this is my bread. This is my fish. This is for my family. Did he do that? Did he say, well, how about I give you one loaf and half a fish, but I've got to keep the rest myself? No. Hey, kid, can I borrow your bread and fish? Yes, sir. And he gave everything he had. He gave it all to him. You know what, gang? I started praying this this week. Lord, I don't want to hold anything back. 
I'm going to give you all five loaves and both fish. I think praying in God's will must include our willingness to hand everything and everyone over to Jesus. We are to surrender all, all that we are, all that we have, and every person in the scenario, every person in the circumstance, and everything we could lose. We hand everything over to God, not holding anything back. All of our worries, all of our fears, all of our cares, and all the people involved. So praying according to God's will is, number one, you come to the Lord in faith. You come to the Lord in faith, and you believe that He is God, and He has the power, the ability, and the know-how to handle this. Number two, you don't pray according to your will. You lay down your will, and you say, God, you take over. And then number three, when you lay down that will, you lay it all down. You lay everything down. You don't hold anything back for yourself. You don't say, I'll trust you with 90% of it, God, but this 10%, I've got to handle myself. No. Here's all five loaves and both fish. I want to close um, with, with this. And I, this, this came to me yesterday, and, and um, well, I hope it encourages you. So this is a little illustration that I, that I thought of yesterday. Um, 15, 16 years ago, we were at a different church. The boys were little. David was five. It's kind of hard to imagine somebody this tall was once somebody this tall. Right? Um, and of course, five-year-olds, you know, their, their children's church consists mainly of crafts. That's what happens. But it was Father's Day. And so this is easy, man. Father's Day at church you know, with kiddos. The five-year-olds are going to make dad a tie. Oh, boy. So, of course, the teachers give all the kids a blank piece of paper. Okay, draw your tie. And boy, what a creation that is. I mean, the lines are just jagged and, you know, all kind of mist thing. And okay, there's your tie. Now cut it out. And they give you the kids the scissors with the rounded edges, and they're cutting. And they're not cutting on the lines. And they're cutting inside. They're cutting outside. You know, this thing just looks awful. So they have this tie. Okay, now we're going to decorate it. We're putting glitter in places it shouldn't be, and whatever those little, you know, bright circles are—I don't know what they're called—but you know, they're, they're just glue spots that are dripping. And 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 now we're going to write something to Dad. Great, can't read it. It's a scribble on there, you know. And now we're gonna we're gonna put a piece of yarn on there so he can wear it. Oh, great. So they put a hole in the top of the tie. They put a piece of yarn, and of course they don't account for how big Dad's head is. I got a huge noggin, all right, so they put this thread on there. There's the tie, and you look at this monstrosity that's been created. And if you tried to put that on eBay, nobody would buy it, right? But there comes David, and he's coming down with his tie with a smile as big as he could get on his face, and he goes, here, Dad, I made this for you. Happy Father's Day. Now, nobody on planet Earth would think that that's a precious gift. Nobody on the planet Earth would go look at that and go, that's precious, except for one person. And who's that? Dad. His daddy. I look at that stupid, <laughs> awful, glue-ridden tie that I could barely fit over my head. I look at it with joy in my heart because my boy made it for me. And I stick it on my head after much consternation, and I wear it the rest of the day proudly. Because my boy made it. Because my boy made this out of his heart, and he gave it to me. Beloved, we should look at prayer that way. See, Satan tries to convince you. Really? You? You're going to approach the throne of grace? You're going to talk? You're not worthy to talk to God. And God sort of shoves him aside, shut your hole, and listen to me. I don't listen to my kids' prayers because they're perfect. In fact, my son, my daughter, they're as imperfect as you can get. They got glue stains all over them. They got glitter hanging places that shouldn't be hanging. 
They got their, their life is not this straight line, it's jagged, and it, they haven't cut straight at all. I mean, I placed a path in front of them, but somehow they don't go straight. They just kind of veer off over here, and I got to get them every time. And they disobey me, and they fail. But when they come to me with this creation called prayer from their hearts, and they say, I mess up, but boy, I love you. Here's my prayer that I'm offering to you. Oh, my word, do I delight in those words. Because they come from the very depth of my children. They come from the very depth of the heart of my son or my daughter. And I hang on every word, and I delight in every word they say to me. That's how God feels about his children when we pray. And God can handle it when we pray wrong. And sometimes our motives aren't what they need to be. He can handle it. He's in charge of, of the correction. But beloved, every time you pray, you're offering him a, the greatest gift that you can give him. You're offering him your heart. And what father doesn't delight in that? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you, God, for this day again and for your word and for the truth. And Lord, we get bombarded with what's not true all the time. But God, we love you and you created that love. You love us first and that's why we love you back because of the salvation you've given us. And Lord, we're not going to be perfect, not even close, and what's more, you know that already. You're not demanding that, Lord. You're doing the perfecting. And we won't be perfect and complete and whole and mature completely until glory anyway. But Lord, help us to identify these things in our lives where we're off. Maybe our prayers are off because we're not seeing you rightly. Or maybe we're seeing ourselves wrongly. God, help us to know that we have the full resource of the power of God at our, in our hands and, and, and in our voices when we pray to you. And God, somehow in this dynamic of commun communing with you and communication with you, God, your, your will is unleashed and it's activated when we pray, when we pray according to your will. Help us remember, Lord, that prayer is significant and it's not something that we should doubt. In fact, it's something we should prioritize above everything else. And Lord, help us to remember how much we are delight to your heart because of what you've given us, the life you've given us. God, help us to pray according to your will. And, and Lord, help us to see that every time we speak to you, you hear us. And every prayer, we, every request we, we ask of you, Lord, you answer it. And let us know that, to be confident of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, everybody. <laughs>